Well, hope everyone's had a super fantastic, amazing day. Um, we're going to get into some good stuff tonight, and I think that it's, it's extremely relevant. But before we do, I was thinking about this earlier today. So I don't know if you guys grew up in an era where you had chores, like you, you know what I'm saying, like chores to do around the house. I don't know if that's like still legal in the parenting world, you know, because every, <laughs> like really, like these days, like, you know, you can probably, if, I don't know if it's legal, but anyway, at our house, we still do chores, right? <laughs> so, our two old, now our youngest, we're, we're still giving him a little bit of time, he's only 14 and a half months, but our two older ones, 11 and 9, um, they have chores, right? So every single day they have so many chores that they do. And then at the end of the week, you know, we try to keep track and then they get rewarded with what we would call an allowance or however you want to say, we pay them, right? To do that. And they have other chores that they're just supposed to do because they're part of the team, right? So my son in particular has certain chores every day. Like he just needs to do them. Very simple, right? So he gets up, any clothes in his room, on the floor, any towels, whatever, he gets, he takes them over. We have a laundry chute. You guys remember laundry chute? Remember, this is kind of cool, right? So mm -hmm. you, you have this thing, you like put it in and it drops down, right? So we got one of those. And that's just every single day he's supposed to do that, right? And he's supposed to pull his, you know, stuff on his bed up and, and kind of make his bed as good as an eight-year-old can make their bed, right? Mm -hmm. So it does that every day. It's super easy, right? And if he keeps up with it, I mean, come on. Little boys don't wear that much clothes, like, you know, every day. But here's the thing. If he misses a day, right? Or if he misses a whole week, and then we go up into his room and we open the door and we look in there, what does it look like? right so a little bitty job that was super easy to do he had two jobs you know he had to just every day if he just picks up three or four little pieces of stuff and throws it down the chute like it's all taken care of however after like a few days it starts piling up and then he starts looking at it like oh i can't do that you know without mom or whatever and then the next thing you know it comes the weekend and we go upstairs and we're like what happened right so when you think about your immune system which is what we're going to talk about tonight your immune system has two jobs that's it, only two. The first job for your immune system is to keep your body clean on the inside. It cleans things up every day. It cleans things up, right? The other job that our immune system has is it defends. Does that make sense? So it defends. So a foreign invader comes in, it recognizes it and it defends. But here's what happens. If we are constantly bombarding our bodies with things that make it clean all the time, it doesn't defend as well. Does that make sense? Because it starts to pile up and it starts to get behind. So then it's spending all this time just trying to clean up what we did to it over the past years, days, months. So then the, the ability for it to defend itself actually decreases. Does that make sense? Because it just can't do both jobs perfectly if it's spending all of its time trying to clean up from the day before, right? So when it comes to our immune system, number one, we just have to realize that it's only got two jobs, right? To clean and defend. But what we also have to understand is that the choices that we make every day actually impact how good it can do those two jobs, cool? So if my son would just get up every day and put his clothes away and pull his sheets up, he would do very, very good at that job. But when he starts getting behind a little bit and it starts stacking up, he does horrible at the job because then it's like his mind goes <laughs> and he looks down and he's like, I can't pick all that up, you know? I'm like, well, you know, how did it get like that? You know, and it's like, well, I didn't do it this day and this day. So it's it's the same thing. So if you can envision your, your body on the inside with the things that we're exposed to in our environment, with the foods that we eat, with the stress that we have, all of that junk starts to pile up. And every single day, every single night, our immune system is trying to go back through and clean up what we just did. So if we're making better choices, if we're not putting as much toxins or junk in there, it's a lot easier job. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's crucially important when we start getting into our immune system. I'll say something. Yeah, I'm not even going to say that. So we, we, we were going to call this something else. So we, we decided to call it body armor. I'm hoping that makes sense. For some people, that doesn't make sense. But we're, we call it that because, you know, despite the common thought right now that our bodies are weak and frail and that, you know, we can just die from anything, the truth is, is that our bodies are strong and our bodies are made to fight. And they're actually made to fight viruses and bacteria. And they're not only made to fight viruses and bacteria, we actually have to be exposed to viruses and bacteria to even have a strong immune system in the first place, right? Yes. So think about going way back in time, because like, you know, these days everyone's kind of, you know, especially like our kids, like we kind of act like they're real wimpy and we, 
we, like we want to put bubbles around them. But think about when we were growing up, like compared to like nowadays, right? I mean, we used to like play in the dirt. We used to eat dirt. We used to eat rocks. We used to go outside. <laughs> think about what we used to do, right? And then we think about like what we would or wouldn't let our kids do nowadays. Like it's like, or if we do let our kids do that, people think we're like crazy, right? I mean, I remember like when we had our first, you know, you had your first little kid, right? And like, you're so scared about everything because you know, you don't know how to do anything. So, you, you know, you go to the store and you can buy a, you know, a toaster and you get like a 40 page manual and you have a baby and you don't get anything, right? And they just say, yeah, here you go, right? So you're scared of everything. So like, you know, you get the binky and like if it even just falls out and hits their shirt, you're like right there, you know, you're cleaning it and you're washing it and you put it back in there and you know, no one can get close or none of that. And by the time you have your third kid, you like drive over it take it through the dirt and you're just like oh I'd be a kid you know, like, you know because it's like you, you realize that these kids are actually a lot tougher than what you think they are right so somewhere along the line from knowing that until now we forgot it right and one of the reasons I believe we forgot it is because what we see every day in front of us is telling us that that's not true right so we were talking just a little bit before we started that for the last four months or however long it's been four years it seems like right We've been hearing about this coronavirus. And I mean, every day, all day long, there's people on TV talking about it. But I, I think you would be very challenged to go back and watch all that footage and find one person that was talking about your immune system in a positive way in regards to how to strengthen it, how to make it better, how to make sure, hey, if you wanna fight this virus, don't worry so much about it. Worry about how strong you are, not one. Now they'll talk about the immunocompromised because they're trying to you know, scare the living daylights out of you. So then they're going to hunker down even more. But there's been zero conversation about how to actually strengthen the host to make sure if you do encounter it, you're going to be okay. Like that's a, that's a big conversation. So what we want to do is we want to change the, the focus and change the conversation to how big and scary and crazy this virus is to how amazing and strong and powerful your body was actually designed. How about that? And if we're not in a situation where that's happening, then well, what can we then do to make sure that we're making improvements? Because here's the thing, how many of you think in here that this is gonna be the last virus that we have to go up against, right? So guess what, there's gonna be another one. And one thing that we learned about the coronavirus in particular is that people with comorbidities with additional health problems are way more at risk than people who are healthier and take care of themselves. So guess what? The next time that comes around, guess which group I wanna be in? Do you think I wanna be over here and more at risk and, more likely to die and, and you know more likely to get sick or you think I want to be over here with in the group that is strong that's healthy that's resilient that can adapt that's that's been taking care of their body which one yeah so if that's the case then we need to know how to do that so let's 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 dive in here just a little bit so a couple things tonight we're going to talk about what your immune system is I already touched on that but you're going to see that a little more in depth number two what types of things weaken your immune system we're going to talk about that right so if we have this system in our bodies that's actually made to fight and defend, we probably should know, number one, what weakens it, but we should also be talking about what can we do to support it and strengthen it. We're gonna talk about that through the four fundamentals, which will be things like our thoughts. You know, listen, what you believe about the coronavirus has a lot to do with how you're gonna to react to it. True, right? Our nerve supply, we're gonna talk about that. Our nutrition and the, the nutrients that we put in our body, our ability to exercise and move and oxygenate. Do you know like the main trouble that we're running into with coronavirus is it's a, a lack of the body's ability to get oxygen to the cells. That's actually what's killing people. So it's probably a good idea to make sure we know how to get oxygen to our cells. And then lastly, we're gonna to touch a little bit on toxicity. So it says here, you know, for he who has health has hope and he who has hope has everything. I would say this, the way to replace fear is with hope and also with knowledge. And for us who, believe, or who are believers, we would add faith, right? Like faith okay. and fear, they don't go together, right? right? So we have to make sure that we're paying attention. And that's where the focus is so big. And even though the world is screaming so loud at us right now, and, and there's so much chaos, and we're not just talking about COVID, we're talking about you know racial issues and riots. and all, So all this stuff is getting our attention, right? But we have to be able to take all that and at the same time, remember what the truth is and what the truth is that we know. And that all that stuff is going on. There's still one person that's in control of it all. Right? And that's what we have to have faith in. That's it. <clears throat> so what's your immune system? And I, I kind of told you the two jobs, but let's give you a more you know, thorough definition. The immune system is your body's defense against infectious organisms and other invaders. 
through a series of steps called immune response, the immune system attacks organisms and substances that invade your body systems and cause disease. So here's the thing, right now as you sit here, there's blood pumping through your veins that has little bitty cells in there that are looking for things that aren't supposed to be there. Like COVID, like cancer, like whatever else, bacteria. It's looking for those things that are out of control, that there's an overgrowth, whatever, and it looks for those, and then that's its job, is to make sure that it keeps you healthy, right? So that's what it's doing, that's the immune system. Very, very important. A lot of times we'll hear people say, this, this is just not about your immune system, this is about health in general, but we buy into this idea that health is how we feel, and health is how we look, right? Because that's our culture. So if you look a certain way, people just assume that you're healthy, right? But let me ask you this. How did you know someone who looked pretty healthy? Who was it? Or who looked pretty healthy and then got diagnosed with cancer? Or who looked pretty healthy and then had a stroke? Or who looked pretty healthy and then had a heart attack? Agreed? Yeah. How many of you know some of those same people that you're thinking about that actually felt pretty good up until the very instant that it happened? Or they felt good even when they got the diagnosis, right? Yeah. They felt great, they went in for their annual physical, they get a test back, it says they have cancer, and they don't even feel any different, right? They still feel the same as they did, but now they know they've got this thing. So health isn't about how we feel, it's about how we function, but just having those symptoms doesn't mean your immune system is strong, right? Think about this. Having symptoms can actually be a perfect uh, sign that you have an immune system that's working. So watch. <coughs> symptoms really will do two things, okay? Symptoms will warn you, right? They'll let you know something's not right. Or symptoms can actually be part of your immune system fighting, okay? So watch, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but think about it. If you encounter a virus of any kind, or bacteria, and it gets inside your body, what can your body do? It'll create a what? What does it try to do? A fever, right? We would consider a fever a symptom, true, right? That's one of the symptoms that they're measuring on everybody right now. You go in and you know, <laughs> right? They're trying to, you know, do you have a fever, right? Well, a fever is a symptom, but a fever is not a symptom that's trying to hurt you. A fever is not a symptom that's even trying to warn you necessarily. A fever is a symptom that's trying to help heal your body. So there's two things. When you get a symptom, if you get a headache, that's a symptom that's trying to warn you that something's not right. If you have high blood pressure, that to me is a symptom that's letting you know something's not right. If you have a fever, that's a symptom that's letting you know your body is up against something and is trying to take it out. Another symptom, not real fun, but if you have diarrhea, yeah, that's a symptom. Guess what? That's a symptom that's trying to get something out of your body rather quickly, right? But maybe that needs to be done. So just recognizing that symptoms, not only do no symptoms, that doesn't mean you're healthy. Having symptoms doesn't actually mean you're real sick. It just means your body's maybe doing exactly what it's supposed to do. How crazy is that, right? We have been taught our whole lives that symptoms are the problem, and as soon as they show up, we gotta bash them out, right? That's why if someone has a fever, they've been told, take Tylenol, get it down. Someone has a cough, get rid of it. Someone's got diarrhea, stop it. Right. right? I mean, come on. If your body's trying to flush something out that quick, maybe it needs to get out of there. Maybe we shouldn't plug it up. Right? <laughs> you know? Like, but see, we don't think about that stuff. But it's like sometimes we got to take the science hat off and we have to put the common sense hat back on. I think one thing that we've learned this year, if anything, is that common sense is not so common, right? Exactly. right? Logic is gone, reason is out, science doesn't matter. So it's like, we, we just have to come back to the basics. But this is a big one here, and just understanding why symptoms even are there. Symptoms are warning signs or your body's healthy response to try to get rid of something that's fighting. They're like fire alarms, you know? If you're sleeping in your bed at night all cozy, and all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off, right? 2 a.m. Most of you, I would suggest, don't just go pull the batteries out and go right back to bed, right? You probably go look and see what's up, right? What if your batteries are dead? And it still goes off? No. Oh. No, it doesn't go off. <laughs> is that what like happens to the people that are healthy? Is like their batteries are dead? It's well, like their immune system isn't working? Is that why they didn't have I, any symptoms? I would say that in that situation, I guess the example would be if, if you have no symptoms, you may or may not be fighting anything, but the assumption that just because that's the case in that instant that you're healthy would be off. You know, there's other ways to know. Now, if, if you encounter something, most likely if it gets to a certain point, you're gonna get symptoms, you just are. Now, do symptoms manifest the same for everybody? Absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. I mean, some people will have manifestation of symptoms of musculoskeletal form. Some people don't have a lot of back and neck pain, but they'll have digestive issues. Some people don't have any of those, but they have thyroid problems. Like it can manifest many different ways. Some people don't have any of those symptoms, but they can't sleep at night. Some people sleep at night and still don't have energy. Like all those are different ways the symptoms start to surface, but because we've never been taught to ask the question why, we never get there. So what we've been taught to do is, well, I can't sleep at night, so I'll take this to force my body to go to sleep. I have no energy in the morning, so I'll drink 17 cups of coffee or energy drinks to keep me going. Right? See, that's what, that's how we, we've just been taught to chase and, and manage the symptoms. And sometimes we have to do that and control it through different means, but we also should be asking why it's there. So it's just recognizing that we need the fire alarm to save us, but then we need to figure out where the fire started and how do we get it better, okay? Um, you know, you know, this is just one of those rhetorical things, honestly, but if, if we can walk through and teach people the strategies to be stronger, this is something that lasts forever. It's kind of like going back to that old, whatever you want to call it, that cliche statement of, you know, give someone a fish they can eat once, where you teach them how to fish, you know, they can eat forever. And it's the same thing here. It's like, listen, you know, we can treat a symptom that you have this moment, but the next time you encounter the next thing, you're gonna be right back where you were if you don't start taking the steps necessary to keep yourself going. Have we at my house done additional things the last four months to keep our immune system strong? Absolutely. Have my kids taken additional supplements? Absolutely. Are we running around in fear like our pants are on fire? No, but we're trying to be smart. We try to wash our hands. We try not to go, you know, I'm not just going and giving everybody hugs at Walmart. You know, I'm not doing that. Like we try to be smart, but we have to then do other things to say, listen, the likelihood that all of us in this room are going to encounter COVID-19 is extremely high at some point. Just like when we were growing up, for you to avoid the chicken pox was almost impossible because it's a virus and it goes through the community, right? But it's just understanding if that's the case, I want to make sure that if I do run into it, I'm as strong as possible. And if you are, you may not ever even have any symptoms, or if you do, they're most likely going to be mild. They just will be. So the four fundamentals, let's get into this. The things that weaken your immune system, first we're gonna talk about the four things that destroy it, and then we're gonna talk about some things that build it. The number one thing is stress. Now we have to watch this because stress comes in lots of forms, emotional, chemical, physical. And this is where for a lot of people, I worry and have concern because they emotionally allow themselves to get so stressed out, we don't realize how detrimental that is to our immune system and our body in, in general. And so they may not have as much physical stress and they may not have as much chemical exposure, but if they're constantly in that stress state, anxious, um, worried, like that creates turmoil inside your body. And that is a big one for most people. Subluxation. Now, this is just a, a chiropractic word for interference to your nerve system. This is also big. Your immune system is super important. Your nervous system is tied into regulating that immune system and it's directly connected into its function based on your ability to stay out of the sympathetics long enough for the parasympathetics to allow your body to heal and digest and recover. And for a lot of people, because of this, they never get there. How about this one? Sugar, processed foods, you know, gut and health issues, you know, in that GI tract. The gut itself has about 80% of your immune system in it. And so the strength of your immune system is directly connected to the health of your gut. Uh, germs and toxins, yeah, these are real and they actually can build your immune system, but at a certain point, if there's too many of them, it will start to beat you down. So here we go, let's talk about stress. What, what are some things? Listen, the stress in your life, and you know, there's some big words here, but psycho neuroimmunology, there's science out there that shows the impact of daily stress on your physical body. So think about this, have any of you ever been in a situation where maybe there was a loss in the family or a loss of a job or something stressful in a relationship? And because of all that stress you were going through, like you, you make it through the funeral, you, you make it through, you know, all the visitation stuff, but then the next week, guess what happens? Yeah. And guess what? You get what? Yeah. You get sick, right? You ever notice that? Or you go to the holidays, right? And you're around your family and you eat all that food and you, you know, you have all that hustle and bustle and you're trying to get all the presents wrapped and all that stress and everyone's coming to your house and it's gotta be perfect and all that stuff. Right. And then the next week, guess what? We're sick. Right. So that's that connection between emotional stress and physical expression of that stress through symptoms. Long-term or, long or chronic stress through too much wear and tear can ravage the immune system. This is important. This is important. Here's how it works. You got stress, mm -hmm. hits the brain, it causes all kinds of different behaviors and disorders and, and, and can lead to different diagnosis, but here's why. 
the brain works based on feedback. So if the brain is getting a stressed feedback loop in, its response in the body is a stress response. So here's what I mean. Within your nervous system, you've got two branches, right? So you've got the sympathetics, which is the fight or flight, right? So if you're in a stress situation, so let's, let's just imagine for a second that that door's locked, that door's locked, and someone comes in and they open it up real quick, they put a lion in here, and then they shut the door and lock it again, right? And we're all in here, right? So in that moment, guess what? Your body's gonna be in the, the fight or flight, right? The stress response. So all of us guys, because we're guys, we're gonna come over here behind all you ladies. <laughs> we're gonna push you that way, and then we're running out the back, right? But that's what happens. You either gotta fight or you gotta run, right? And that's supposed to be that. But in that moment, you're not worried about digesting food. You're definitely not worried about taking a nap and you're not worried about relaxing, right? So all that energy is put towards blood to the extremities, your senses are up, you're ready to go. Now, on the other side of that, you've got the parasympathetics. This is the one that allows you to get restful sleep. It allows you to chill out. It allows you to recover. It allows you to digest food and it allows you to heal. So here's the thing, because God's smart, he put both of those in there, but we gotta make sure we're using both. And a lot of people are only using the sympathetic, so they never get out of that. And these are the people who are more worn out. These are the people who don't get restful sleep. These are the people who have digestive problems. These are the people that have you know, that type of daily you know, encounter with their own body, but it's because those systems are out of whack and we gotta make sure we get those back in balance. And then yes, inside that gut is important too. And we'll talk about that a little bit with you know, your microbiome and your leaky gut and things like that, if that exists. As far as subluxation goes, this can be super simple, right? So you've got this spinal cord, you've got your brain sitting up here, attached to that, it goes through here, you've got every one of these holes here where these nerves come out and they branch out and they go to everything. So they go to your neck and your low back and your hips and your feet and your fingers, but they also go to your bowels and your reproductive organs and your heart and your lungs and your sinuses and your everything that controls energy and sleep and mood and hormones and metabolism, all channeled through here and when the stress of our life gets to be too much, these bones will shift out of position and irritate and aggravate these nerves from inflammation and from joints not moving. And then it will create symptoms of all kinds. And depending on where it happens, will dictate the symptoms that show up. Make sense? And in direct connection with your brain can also throw you into that stress state, that sympathetic state, which then doesn't allow your body to bounce back and recover. So it's kind of this, it's this big loop that's really a, a, is trouble. And for different people, you can know if this is going on just based on the different types of symptoms either that you've had or have, and it's just letting you know that that subluxation is still there at some level, and that's why these symptoms still persist. And there's all kinds of reasons for that, but that's where it comes from. Listen, a lot of times when I talk to people about the nerve system, they're not all on board because it's new to them. They don't understand like how the nerve system impacts everything else and they think more just, you know, I pinch a nerve, it makes my back hurt. They don't think about where those nerves go. But think about Christopher Reeves, right? So we all know him, he's the original Superman. And this guy was riding a horse, right? As healthy as I guess he could be, falls off, breaks the top bone in his neck, very top bone, it moves one centimeter one centimeter into his cord. It doesn't sever the cord, it moves one centimeter into the cord. And then guess what? What happened to everything down below that? It shut off. When he was riding the horse, guess what? His lungs were still breathing, his heart was still beating, his bowels were still working, his arms and fingers and toes were all working. Nothing wrong with any of those things. He had one bone shift out of position in his spine and hit that cord <coughs> and it shut everything down. A neck problem made his body shut down. See, that's where we have to, we have to understand. Those nerves that are going through there, they're, they're a big deal. And most people know that when it gets to this level, but we don't think about it in the more micro traumas of every single day and how that accumulates over not just a day, but over your entire lifetime. And then how that stress manifests around that nerve system. Now, this next one, how about this? Processed foods, sugars, and the gut. So when a person is malnourished, the immune system is weakened. So we live in a culture where no one's really, well, I shouldn't say no one, most people are not under, <clears throat> undernourished as far as food content or amount, but we're malnourished because we're not getting quality food. Does that make sense? So we have access to lots of food, but they're not, it's not nutritious to our body, cool? When you restore the person to normal nutrition, the immune system also improves. When you continue to improve nutrition beyond mere adequacy, the immune system continues to improve, even in healthy people. That's what's so amazing about our bodies 
it's dynamic. It will continue to multiply and compound the good choices that we make and move you forward. So that's why even if you've been doing good for a long time and you do one thing that's wrong, it doesn't destroy it all because your body can bounce back and still leverage. But it's, if it goes in the other direction too. If all we're doing is constantly making bad choices over and over and over, it pulls us in the other direction as well. So that's where you know the connection between the things that we eat. We know directly that sugar will suppress the immune system for hours, hours. And so we just have to be careful if we're trying to build our immune system up, how much of that we're getting what the recovery time is, and other things we can substitute in because you know we want, we, we want you to still enjoy food, but not at the expense of your health and your immune system. Um, the gut, surprising symptoms of gut problems. Some of these are gonna be surprising and some won't. Obviously the one that's not so surprising is this. So if you or someone you know suffers with these things, you, you more than likely have gut trouble. So digestive problems, not too surprising. True? Chronic colds. Recurring colds, recurring infection, that's a sign of gut trouble. How about this? Allergies. Allergies, super common. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, it's just it's because we live in the... But what that means, when you have an allergy, it means your body and your immune system is reacting to something it shouldn't. It's hypersensitive to something that it shouldn't be reacting to, so that's not right. That's not That shouldn't happen. Uh, ear infections. Skin trouble. Most people don't think about this either. You know, the skin is our biggest organ. But the things that manifest on the skin almost always are coming from within. So just remember that. If it's on the skin, it's coming from within, right? We don't hear that much, but that's where it's coming from. And a lot of times it will manifest, I mean, it could be fungal. It could be uh, different types of viruses. It could be uh, a lot of toxicity coming out through the skin that shows up on the skin and causes skin issues. But these are all things that should cause us to look back towards this gut and try to figure out where the problem might be. So we talked a little bit about autoimmune. Autoimmune doesn't necessarily mean you have a weak immune system. It just means that you have an immune system that in some way, shape or form is actually attacking your own body, right? So I don't know if there's a, a real easy way for me to explain this, you know, right now, but I'll, I'll try. So if you can imagine, you know, let's imagine that these big, you know, banana hands are like your colon, okay? So just, that's how it works, right? So as food's coming through your colon, right? So it's kind of, you know, well, you ate a little bit, and then it's coming down and it makes it through your stomach and now it's, you know, it's making its way down the, down the pipe, right? So it's coming down the pipe and when you get in here, it's starting to break down and get digested. So it gets digested in these little bitty parts. We'll call them, they're, they're proteins, but we'll say little pieces or parts. Well, in your colon, you've got little holes. They're called gap junctions, okay? And they're perfectly designed and perfectly sized for the proteins that are supposed to get through there. Does that make sense? You break it down, they squeeze through, whatever's left goes out the other side, okay? Now, here's what happens with leaky gut. Because of the stress in our life, because of the foods that we eat, because of medication,